Jesus, your all this heart is living for. Broken, I run to you for your arms. I open wide. I am weary, but I know. Restores my life, and so I wait for you. So I wait for. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us to have recourse to thee. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, we will begin this uh, part of the day with uh, a reflection on Jesus. So, we're going to talk about Jesus. And I'm going to start with the book of Revelations, chapter 3, from verse 1. Write this to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says he who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your word. You think you live, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen that which is not already dead. For I have found your works to be imperfect in the sight of my God. Remember what you were taught, keep it and change your ways. If you do not repent, I will come upon you like a thief at an hour you least expect. Yet, there are some left in Sardis who have not soiled their robes. These will come with me. Dress in white, since they deserve it. The victor will be dressed in white, and I will never erase his name from the book of life. Instead, I will acknowledge it before my Father and his angels. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we know that uh, Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is Lord of our lives. And the word, the name Jesus, it is beyond our understanding. And besides, it is our healing name. It's the name of, above all names. And we, are, we understand that we walk along this life um, reaching Him, always longing after Him uh, since we have been baptized because He is inhabiting us since we were given His Spirit. So there is no way we can get away from it because He is the persistent lover. He's after his loved ones. And we are those. He loves us. And he wants us. And he created us for him. So it is amazing to uh, learn to discover Jesus in our lives. And uh, Jesus is very particular about how he let himself be discovered in our hearts. Um, it seems many times as if he play, spends a great part of our lives in hiding. But it seems to be that way, but it's never that way, because he cannot hide, because he is everywhere. And we are the ones that hide our way of seeing him, because 
he is too perfect for us so one time I was given a retreat to the youth in Portugal and uh, in one of the breaks between talks we had a session of questions and one of the youngsters asked me why is God invisible so I thought I'm not going to answer the easy way because usually you will say because you know that's the way it is any great theologians will probably answer that <clears throat> so I went I told the youngster I'm gonna answer to you when we come back from the break so I went to the Blessed Sacrament and I told Jesus I'm not gonna give him the easy answer you need to give me the answer the real one I don't have it you know so I stay there for as long as the break and nothing happened I was walking away back to the place to where we had the the conference and I had this incredible clarity in my heart saying I am not invisible I am perfectly visible that's why you need to become perfect so you can see me so I went to to the youngsters and I told them what I had and there was a big silence you know you can hear a pin drop it was beautiful silence and it was also for me like amazing because it was perfect and this is what it is it is truly what it is so that's why walking towards Jesus longing for him is his greatest moment he loves us to be longing for him many times we wonder why did what does why does God needs us uh, why does he needs our attention why does he need that us to adore him he's God he's got everything doesn't need anything but at the end you understand that is not that God needs us is that God needs us to need him because he is God the only one and we need to focus on the real one on the only one and he wants us to do that so that we can make it home because if we are focused on the real God we make it to the real God because we are in exile it is an amazing mystery to understand or better to say though we don't understand why we are in exile but we accept it in faith first to accept that we are in exile that alone is like what is that you know why what is that and secondly that Jesus has come down to us and reveal himself physically to us as a God and has told us that he is going to take us back where we belong back to paradise where we were thrown out from so this is all beyond our little understanding we don't we don't get that because you know that's why there are so many atheists they they get to bring reason into this they don't make it reason will never make it and uh, but the beauty of just letting God and for us to let go is love Jesus is love so what he's teaching us in his mystery is to let go let go every time you don't get it let go anything that has to do with him it's like uh, someone dies in the family and you look at God like saying why and his only answer is because let go it's like uh, in my community we are called the pilgrims of love that's the name of my community 
we were praying for 400 and I guess 56 days continuously or 96 days, something like that, 596 days in a spiritual battle against communism so that communism wouldn't take over Colombia, right? We did that. We never know what God is going to do. And uh, many times I said, we are going to crush communism because Jesus is with us and blah, 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 in many of the prayers and many. Because that's the way you pray, right? With faith. But it didn't happen. They won. So that day, last Sunday, I was looking at Jesus at the Blessed Sacrament going like, what is this? You know, like, I didn't say a word. But he knows, he knew my, my, my way of looking was going like, Jesus, <laughs> what are you up to? And uh, he's always there saying, like, so what? You know, just let go, let go. This is beyond us, it's not for us to understand, it's for us to let go. And this is the way it goes. There, is, there are too many things we need to let go in order to let God. See? And He's happy when we let go. He always has a smile. Saying, it's not about understanding it. It's about accepting it like it is because this is the will of God. And you know, the teachings of this letting go, you find them in Gethsemane. You see Jesus, the human Jesus, telling God, take this cup away from me, but let not my will be done, but yours. And this is so amazingly perfect, because He is God, but He is also human, right? Imperfect. He has fears. He's got all kinds of limitations, as we do. And it's very hard to understand that God becomes like that. Like the word says, inferior to angels temporarily. He did, he became like that. And you can see that in Gethsemane. You can see it on the cross. The words he says on the cross. You know, totally human. But his divinity is the one leading him into this incredible death that is actually life. But through death. And this is believing in something we don't understand. It's going through death, which is not knowing. It's something that we cannot understand. But we know there is something beyond that, even though we don't get it. And what is beyond what we don't understand? Life. Because what we don't understand is death. Yeah, when, when you see something that is totally unexplainable, incomprehensible, absurd, that's like death, you know, it's like there is no life in there, there is no explanation. You cannot say anything about it. But then when you let go, beyond that, it's life, it's God, it's perfect. And this is what this life is about. This is what Jesus is about. You see... The apostles many times were in awe of what he said, what he did. And sometimes you read passages where the apostles were like in ecstasy and will tell Jesus, Master, please increase our faith. And that's so beautiful because that was a moment when they knew how much they needed to learn about him. How much they didn't know. But how much he was right. How much he was the one. But they didn't get it. But they knew they needed more to get it. And they asked Jesus for that. And this is great because this is what we need to have. We need to have that. Those moments of ecstasy with God. When we know, I cannot get it. I don't know. This is beyond me. So increase my faith, Jesus. Please, increase my faith. Because that's the way to let go. See, you let go. You ask the Lord, increase my faith, Lord. 
I'm going to give it to you. I give it to you. You take it. You're the only one that can take it. I cannot. There's nothing I could take from this because I don't even get a dot of this. So only you can take it. Take it from me. Understand that in me. Because I cannot understand it myself. I'm too little for such a big question in my life. I don't even understand what the scriptures are saying in Genesis about the way we were created. I don't know what seven days means. I don't know what Adam and Eve means. I don't know why they were thrown out of paradise. All of this is hard to make. And then you see heretic theologians coming up with, the, with a different Genesis, you know, and you have all these confusions in our theology, but still, there is something very important. One time, I was giving a retreat to seminarians in the U.S., in Detroit, and uh, one of the seminarians told me, I am very, very upset and confused, because we have, I, I forgot how many teachers, and he says none of them understand each other. And they are teaching us a different theology, each one of them. They all come from different schools. And all they say is, that is the school I studied, that, that's the theology I have. And uh, so the seminarian said, so what am I to do? You know, if I don't obey them, they will fail me, and I w I'm not going to make it. But I want to be a priest, that is my vocation. But all of this about the seminary and my formation... It's like a nightmare. He was very sincere, very young man. He came from a big family, which is not very common. And uh, he had a great anointing. I had no fear. The biggest sign was no fear. <coughs> he <coughs> said it just like it is. <coughs> One of the teachers was there. He was monitoring the, the retreat. And I knew. He was there in the back. <clears throat> so I said, the first part of the answer, I'm going to give it to you through Father Tom. <laughs> I put him on the spot. <laughs> and he got up really pale, you know, like, and I said, don't worry, Father, just tell them like it is, like, like you know it. Don't worry, nobody's going to judge you. But this is the moment of the truth. What, what is it that you have? Where is those your theology comes from? What can you tell this young man? And he said, well, <clears throat> I can tell you something. I was that seminarian too. <clears throat> and I made it <clears throat> to be ordained. And how? I just let it go, he said. But I believe that our sacred traditions, they have the answer. So I always run to sacred traditions and sane doctrine and I pick up from there the rest I let go and let God and that was a beautiful answer I was never expecting that priest to be that in particular because during the retreat he was someone I could not read and it wasn't because I was trying to read him it's just that he was unreadable, you know. So, and being him, a priest present to monitor the retreat, was kind of like the police, you know, sitting there, the way they did it, because that's the way he felt. And actually it was. He confirmed to me later. They were trying to uh, protect their little shell where they had the seminarians, which was a shell of confusion, really because they were teaching so many different things that contradict each other, that was too confusing. But no one was interested in straightening that up. The bishop or the spiritual directors of the seminary, nobody was involved with trying to make sense out of that. They couldn't, I guess, they couldn't. So, at the end, we see today, uh, I was just in missions in Germany about... Two, day, two months ago, that's when I went through your community in Amsterdam, right? So, you know what is happening there with the synodal way, right? 
and you go to parishes in Germany and people are so confused and so sad when they are good Catholics, you know. And the ones that are liberal and they are progressives, as they call them, they are happy, they are fine with their new theology, with their new church. So when you speak to people that are so confused, the only word that comes out is let go, let God. You pray and you be faithful. You keep your heart faithful and stay there, don't move. It's not about running away. It's not about walking away. It's about staying there with the Lord call you, as St. Paul says. Stay there with God call you. Don't move. See, many times I go to communities, religious communities, and I speak privately to the nuns or the monks or whatever, and many are ready to go. Ready to go. Because of whatever is happening humanly in the community. You know, communities are human. So we human beings are the most mysterious creatures, right? So we, to live among us is the greatest way of sanctifying ourselves. You know, it's like uh, when people get married, I tell them, well, you know, you got married to sanctify yourself with each other. Remember that. The first thing you have to learn is forgiveness. Otherwise, you don't make it. So I get forgiveness right in your forehead, right in your heart, right in your feet, right in your hands, right in your guts. Forgiveness. If you don't have that, never make it. But it applies to every walk of life, wherever you go. Doesn't matter. You cannot run away from that. Because you need to forgive in order to stay where you belong. If you don't forgive, you leave your place. And they find you away from your place. Not a good idea. If Jesus calls you and you are not in your place, he's going to say, what are you doing there? That's not where I call you, right? Well, uh, there's no answer, right? So we need to stay put. We need to stay there. And these are the times when God is testing us really highly with the church. You know the church has had worse times than this. This is nothing compared to what we had in the past. Sometimes with two, three popes at the time, and things were horrible in the past too. Uh, so this is not new. The church is constantly in a spiritual warfare, a spiritual, a spiritual battle that is not ending until Jesus' returns. And the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the tougher the battle. And we were born for these times. I, you know how when people talk about the youngsters today, they say, oh, they came with the chip. They, they know how to work that cell phone. Give them the computer. They don't even read the manual. They know it by heart. See, God creates us for the times we are created. And we are capable of dealing with the times we are created for. So regardless of what is taking place in the world, we know it. We were born with that knowledge. So we know how to handle it. But the thing is, the secret is to learn to let go. And not to try to make sense of that, to manipulate it, and to put your senses in that. Because most of the time, you're going to be wrong. See, you're going to be wrong. So the best way to live this life with God is to be with Him and let Him. Because He's the one that knows. So this is oneness. You know, one of the most incredible prayers of Jesus for us is when He's talking to the Father before His passion and praying for the apostles and praying for all of us that will come after them. He was saying, God, let them be one as you and me are one. And when you think about that, you know there is a big secret with that. To be one with Him. And to be one with Him is an unconditional union. Unconditional union. That's to be one with God. When you become one with Jesus... It's because you have no conditions of your unity with Jesus. It's the only way you can be one with Him. 
because you, it's like I was telling you about the elections in Colombia. I could have walked away from the Lord and become two. See, and go in front of him and say, why did you do that? Look, I was telling people we were going to win. And why would you let me down? See, then I will be separated from them. I will no longer be one. And that's what happened in the desert with the Hebrews. They were tempting God. And many dying one day for tempting God. Because you should never do that. It's not about why. It's about what for, as they say, right? The first one that said why was Satan. Why? I will not obey. And the, why is a rebellious spirit? Why? It's never why. It's always what for, Lord? What do you want me to do? Enlighten me, inspire me, guide me, and I'll do what you want. Only what you want. Though I don't get it, I don't know what you're doing, I don't know what you're up to, but still help me just to walk along with you, to be one with you. And this oneness is our peace, our peace. See, in the midst of the storm, you only have two choices. You get crazy and jump in the water, or you stick to the boat, to the master, master and grab it, and stay there in the midst of the storm. Being one with the storm. One. And then God will do his job. You may end up on the shore or you may drown. But still God is with you. It doesn't matter. You know, it's like an earthquake. I don't know how many of you have been in the midst of a bad earthquake. Have you? Well, I'm glad. <laughs> I have been in the midst of horrifying earthquakes. Very strong. And uh, the first one, I was seven years old, and it was horrible. I was on the second floor in a building, and it was something just beyond you. You know, everything is moving. You can't do nothing, and people are doing nonsensical things because no one is making sense, you know, because it's beyond you. So you see people doing things you can never imagine anyone will try to do. People trying to climb walls and things that are impossible, right? And saying things that you will never say, you know. And so I never got it with the earthquake. The only thing I got was that I was alive when it stopped. You know, <laughs> that I got. Because I never knew I was going to make it. I didn't believe I was going to make it, you know. And some people very close to me died, you know. They, they were crushed by walls and... All, uh, people fell on a hole and then the, the earth closed again. You know, open and closed. It was horrible. They had to dig them out later. So, when you experience something like that, and I mean, know that so many people have experienced worst disasters, you know, like great tsunamis and things like that. Um, volcanoes that erupt at night and cover the whole town, you know, while people are sleeping. That's horrible with fire, you know, lava. So, but one thing is in the midst of all of this, is to understand the storm. We are like little ants in the midst of this creation, like nothing. And this moves all the time. Creation moves, breathes. St. Paul says that creation is panging with, with the pains of birth, you know, because it's awaiting for its freedom, as we are. So all of us are wounded with death. All of us are wounded with imperfection. All of us are aiming for that freedom, longing for that freedom, that we'll only get, we will only get at death. It's the only time. You know, it's hard to even picture the moment we leave this tent, as St. Peter calls it, right? This vessel. The moment we come out of our bodies and enter into the fullness of life and being born into the Spirit. It's beyond our imagination, the feeling of freedom we will have if we die in peace with God. Because you will enter your freedom. That's like beyond anything we can imagine. Because then everything is clear. 
finally, right? And probably you pull, you pull, will go through some pain because a lot of people don't necessarily die in a perfect way and will have to mend and, and do some really work, heavy work to make it into the fullness of the light. But still, you are safe, you made it, you were born into the spiritual world. I tell people in comparison with premature babies, you know, they are born weak, they had to get into an incubator many times and kept there until they get the strength to, to breathe normally in this environment they just got into when they are born. Same, there's no much difference with the spiritual realm. Sometimes souls are very weak. They don't have enough love to survive the spiritual realm. So they are in an incubator, which is purgatory. But that's why the soul is incubating, strengthening, understanding and getting into this spiritual health in order to survive the amazing light of the, of the love of God. You need to be very healthy to breathe within the love of God in His fullness. You need to. That's why every revelation we read in the scriptures of prophets that were taken into a realm where God was, they all melt and go like they cannot stand it, right? And it's because we need this amazing health. And that's why when we speak about Jesus, we speak about that health. There is a vision of the city of light on top of that hill of Zion, Mount Zion, our home, our destination. We are citizens of the light, citizens of that city of light up in the mountain. So we have to climb that mountain and our climbing is invisible to us. We are, but we are actually climbing that mountain while we are here. You see, when we die, we end up where we climb up to. How much we did, we will find out when we die. Some people descend and some people ascend. See, there's only two ways. If you live a sinful life, you are descending. You die, you find yourself really low back there and some don't make it out. That's how low they got. But people that walk in the light with God are climbing towards the city. And when you die, you will find yourself as high as you could make it. You know, that's where you were. That's where you are. So if we all die right now, we will probably be in very different places, each one of us, in that mountain, you know. I hope we can wave to each other or something. But we don't know <laughs> how high we will be or how low. We don't know. The most important thing is to be on that mountain. To be on that mountain. It doesn't matter how high or how low, but to be on the mountain. So we have to stay in the mountain. And it's not easy to climb. You know... Because it's the mountain of love. You can only climb into love. Only through love. It's like, here is the mountain. The mountain is your community. That's the mountain you climb in. Your community. And how do you climb that mountain? Through each other. That's how you climb the mountain. Through each other. Each one of you is a step of the mountain. It's beautiful if you look at it with the love of God. It's beautiful because then every one of you becomes a step of the mountain. You know? So if you know how to step in there, you go higher through each one, each other. It's incredible. It's the, that's why Jesus takes these two commandments for the Ten Commandments, right? And beside the love of God is the love of neighbor. Why? Because it is the secret. You have to learn how to love your neighbor because that is the way you climb. See, you can never climb. Every single human being will be an obstacle or an opportunity. Look at what I was telling you this morning about the beggar that died the day after I spoke to him. 
See, that beggar was an amazing step for everyone. How many people were able to step and go higher through him? How many? I bet, I, I bet very few. Because it was a very mysterious step. See, some people come into our lives... And many times we wish we wish they will never come to our lives, you know. <laughs> and uh, but the big mistake is that that was one of the most important steps in our lives, and we turned it down because it was too difficult, because it was impossible, because of so many reasons. But that was the step that God wanted us to climb. Was important. Was one that will take us much higher much higher because you know easy steps are low climbing hard steps are high climbing and you know it physically it's a physical law you go to a mountain and you see there are little steps but when you take them you're not climbing too high you're just doing little steps but when you take the big step where all yourself is shaking and uh, you almost you almost sliding down. Those are the ones that bring you up, a chunk up, you know. And this is what difficult people do in your life. You see, if you climb that, you get higher, much higher. But what a challenge that is. So that's the mountain, that's Zion. You know, it's a tough mountain to climb. The mountain of love. That is Jesus. And we are taught that the light of that city is Jesus himself. Imagine how glorious that is. We learn that in the Blessed Sacrament. You know, when you go to visit the Lord, and the more you do that, and I know you do that all the time, you end up knowing that that is the light that comes from above. Undoubtedly, you know, here is the light. That is the light. That is the mountain. That is the city of light. That is my destination. I want to get there. And that's why I adore the Lord. Because He is the light. He is life. He is my aim. I want to be there. I want to climb there. And you see, the Blessed Sacrament physically is accessible. It's there. But you know how far it is. You understand how far it is. You can go to the Blessed Sacrament and touch it. You take His blood and His body and eat it and all of that is so accessible and then and yet so far see but god knows us and he knows how limited we are and how far we are though he is so near but it's like sometimes you see we had um, a, a member of our community that was so mysterious, most people didn't get it. She was a, a woman that was very joyful. And uh, what in, in, in common language, they will call her very positive, you know, like optimistic. But that's not a good, a, a good way of describing her. That will be an easy way of despising her, right? But I had to tell people all the time, watch out. And make sure you don't come after, and I will tell them about her. And she spent there over 10 years, I don't know, probably more, 12, 15. And uh, she had cancer, and she passed away just uh, last December. And uh, she will be at the Blessed Sacrament for hours, talking to the Lord. You will come by the Blessed Sacrament, she was there, talking to the Lord like this, you know. I'm going like this, and, and she will tell everybody, what do you need? I'm going to tell Jesus, I'm going to walk, I'm going to be talking to Jesus today, and she will be talking to him in a, in, a, in a very human way, you know, speaking to him aloud. Sometimes you will walk by and hear her, but it's not like she was uh, mystified or illuminated, so to say, no. She was a very simple, plain human being, and will act naturally. But one thing she had that... Hardly anybody else has had in the community. She knew Jesus. She knew him. She could talk to him. For real, you know. Because one thing is to go and pray and do your recitation and psalmody and tell the Lord 
almost in tongues, you know, your feelings and all of that. That's very good. That's part of our relationship with God. But another thing is to get to have Jesus as a person, where you can relate to him as a real person in front of you. You know, a person that is there, that is alive, and you can relate to him, and you know he's there. He's listening, you know he's there, and you're speaking to him as we are speaking to each other right now. For real, for absolutely real. To some people, they will say, yes, but that's the way we do when we go to the Blessed Sacrament. We know he's there, so we speak to him. But if you really think about it, and you get deeper, you will probably find that maybe that relationship that you think is a real, is not the real. Because when it is real, it transforms you into love. Totally. Completely. Some people ask me, how do you do to stay in adoration without falling asleep? And when I go to adoration, I need to bring my rosary, my novenas. I have to read the scriptures or something, a, a holy book or something to stay awake. And I say, you know, it is good to do that because you are with God and why not do like holy activities, like prayer or reading holy books. That's good. But you know, if you really think about it, it's not necessarily a perfect visit, you know. Because think about this. When you come to visit someone you love, you will be wide awake if you're visiting your mother or visiting a friend or someone that is important in your life. You're not falling asleep or you're not bringing a book to stay there with that person to read. You see, no, that person is there and you're very entertained. You're very excited to be visiting that person you love. Wide awake, there. Sometimes people even buy clothes to go and see people they love, you know, to be like present in an extraordinary way. And I say, you see how far we are from visiting Jesus? Too far. You see, it's not enough to be there trying to make you time before him. It is good. It's okay. It's good. It's not perfect, though. It's not exactly what Jesus wants. Imagine Jesus looking at you. You came to visit him and he sees you reading. He sees you growing the rosary 20 times. And he sees you doing all of that. And Jesus is saying, what about me? <laughs> Where am I in the midst of all this activity of yours? Did you come to see me? Can we talk? See, do you know I'm here? Yes, you know. But are you acknowledging me? That's another, that's another level, right? So we, do, we need to do some shifting. And shifting for real. Go into another plane. We need to move on. What is a shifting? A shifting is a daring walk up the mountain. A daring one, you know. We have to dare. Like I was saying this morning, we need to be brave, courageous. That's the only way to make it, be courageous, be brave. That's what Jesus wants. You notice how Peter dared to walk on the water? He told Jesus, if it's you, allow, let me walk on the water towards you. He began walking on the water. And then he began sinking. But I tell you this. Who can dare to do that? That's not easy. He was a daring one, right? But he didn't have it all. He didn't have enough. And Jesus saved him from drowning. But the only thing he said was, man of little faith. He didn't say, bravo, oh, Peter, you did 20 steps. Uh, that is amazing. Never said that. Jesus never congratulated the apostles. You notice that? There is not a single passage where Jesus said, You are wonderful. Let's get some animal here and kill it so we can celebrate. You are great guys, you know. No, never, never congratulated the apostles. Do you see why? Because he is the perfect teacher. He wants you to give it all. It's the only thing he wants. He doesn't want to sort of get there. No. That's mediocrity, that is imperfect. He's the perfect teacher. So he wants you to give it all. All, because he knows if we go for all, we get all. And that's what we, he wants us to. 
So we can never say, I am sort of making it. I am sort of getting buried in adoration. I am sort of praying better. I am sort of forgiving a little bit more. That doesn't work for Jesus. Doesn't work. We are never sort of there. We have to be there. See? It doesn't matter how much it hurts, but we have to give it all. And this is what Jesus wants. That is Jesus. Jesus is the one that wants us to give it all to Him. Because giving it all is being with Him. It's doing what He wants. He wants us to give it all. And this is so important to have it clear. Because you know something beautiful I learned. One day I was very disheartened because I lived a pretty worldly life until I was 47 years old. And then when I was 49, the Lord called me into this ministry. And I was very impacted because I said, how can God call someone like me? And I was almost 50 years old already. I had been away from him so many years and now he's calling me. And I said, how could this be possible? And then one time in adoration, I opened the scriptures because I still didn't have this spiritual growth with I could be in adoration with the Lord one to one. So I needed to get something, right? And be busy with something. Nothing wrong with that, but that's the way I started. So I opened the scriptures and there I went to a passage of St. Paul when he was asking him to take the thorn away from his flesh. Okay, you remember when he answered to Paul and he said, My grace suffices you. I glorify myself in your weakness. And I learned something so strong that day because I said, Yes, I know what Jesus is telling me. No one is worthy of God. Nobody. I can never be worthy of Jesus. Never. But He wants us to humbly give Him everything we can. Everything that we are capable to give. That's what He wants. And if we do that until we die, whatever we lack in, He will give it to us. See, Jesus is completeness. That's what He is. Redemption means completeness. We are incomplete. We are not there. We don't have it all. We cannot have it all. Because we are mortals. We are imperfect. We wouldn't be mortals if we would have it all. But because we are mortals, that means we are, are imperfect and we don't have it all. And Jesus knows it. That's why the being Christ-centered means knowing that only Jesus can complete us. And if we don't become one with the cross of Jesus, we don't make it. So, when we die and we go before the Lord, we know that we didn't bring it all. We didn't make it all. No one comes to Jesus with everything. We are lacking something. But Jesus knew all we wanted was to have it all. So if all you wanted was to have it all, sincerely, whatever you lack in, He's going to complete it. And that's beautiful to know that. It's like when you have a good father or a good mother, or a good friend in the community, a sister that loves you. You know, you made mistakes, but you were working hard enough not to make mistakes. But that person that loves you knows that you didn't want to make mistakes. So your mistakes are not going to be important. But they're going to be a tool of work. We have to work harder on this. Because we don't want to make mistakes. But you will never be judged. You will, your friendship will not diminish. There's no changes in the love. There is only acknowledging of how much harder we have to work. And that is a good father. You see, a good father sees the son is studying to death to make a grade. Spending night longs without sleeping, working really hard. And the day he goes for the grade, he fails and comes back really depressed. And then the father calls the son and says, Son, to me, you made the grade because you gave it all. Don't worry. Let's do it again. Let's work really hard until you make it. But don't worry because for me, you made it. Because I know you gave it all. And that is Jesus. Jesus is that. That good God that knows us. 
So what he was teaching the apostles, he was teaching them to give it all. He wanted Peter to make it to where he was. He didn't want Peter to lose his faith and begin to drown. No, he wanted him to get to him, you know. He gave him everything it took to make it to him. But he didn't punish him for that. He only said, man, a little faith. But that's what it was, you know. But not as a punishment. It was us encouraging him to make it. Encouraging him to do it better. Encouraging him to trust him better. That's why we have this amazing, powerful revelation of divine mercy. I think it's an amazing revelation for these times, you know. St. Faustina with this great experience of Jesus. And this tender God comes along and says, get this image painted and make sure you do this in the, in the bottom. Jesus, I trust in you. And he's eager. He wants to do that. He wants that painting to go everywhere. He wants everybody to know. Jesus, I trust in you. It's like a deliverance. You know, it's like a, an amazing, powerful sentence. Jesus, I trust in you. And it's a message for the times. Because, you know, regardless of what is happening in your life, if you have a moment with Jesus that is real, which means you really truly are there being one with Jesus, and then out of your heart comes these words, Jesus, I trust in you. Whatever was taking place in your life that wasn't good, Whatever was taking the peace away, whatever was just doing wrong to your hopes and you taking your joy away is gone, is delivered when you have this moment with the Lord. When you have this moment with Jesus and acknowledge Him and tell Him that you trust in Him, that's letting go. That's letting God. That's exactly what it is. I'm going to end with a reading. And I read to you from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. In Philippians 1, 12. And it says, Christ is my life. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Actually, the whole Praetorian Guard and even those outside the palace know that I am in chains for Christ. And what is more, my condition as prisoner has encouraged most of our brothers who are now emboldened to proclaim the word of God more openly and without fear. The word of the Lord. And that is beautiful, because that is something we need to do when we... We need to get to the point where we can say, whatever I'm doing is making people stronger, making people believe more in God. That's what happens when we carry the treasure, when God is in us. Whatever we do, regardless of how little it could be, is gigantic, it's very big. I tell people, you want to see how big is God? You have to learn how to see Him in the little things. Bethlehem couldn't be smaller. You know, Bethlehem is the smallest thing you can ever see. The most insignificant moment. You know, God, the all-powerful God being born in that manger, you know that no one in Bethlehem will believe St. Joseph if he goes from door to door to tell them, he's born, the king is born. They will throw rocks at him. Nobody will believe it. It was too small, too insignificant, too absurd to believe that is God. That is the King. But that is exactly how He comes to us. He comes to us in that little nest, that insignificant. I mean, I know that your charisma is probably one of the most powerful charismas about seeing God in the little, in the little ways. Those people that you care for, these broken people, abandoned people, rejected people. That's the littleness of God where hardly anyone knows that Jesus is there. That that is Jesus in the broken one. This world never see that. They cannot see that. 
And it's terrible to see how, how poor this world is in relationship with God. How they looking into the wrong direction, you know? But what can we do? All we can do is be what we are and continue doing what we are because this is the mission we have. Amen.